yeah, all right. So let me repeat again, because it probably isn't so bad. So far, we've done, um, we have done ancient humanism, we've done religion and um, science in Augustine, and then the union of ancient humanism with Christianity. And a lot of you can see the similar patterns between Islam or even other religions you were raised in and Augustine or Aquinas. So I've read all of those posts that at least I caught up until a couple hours ago. So, you know, I think you can see why I assigned that material. There's these, these patterns underneath the apparent differences. So the packaging is different. But if you look underneath in the substance and the way people think and apply the, their things to their lives, their thoughts, or in the way that they want to train their minds how to think, right? So all of this is not, you're not just a detached observer, you know, studying some field. Literally, you're engaged, right? When you start thinking a certain way, you literally are training your psyche and your psyche is being formed by the way you think. And so, yeah, this stuff is all about how do you want to think? It's not just, uh, oh, well, this person thinks this way and that person thinks that way and it's all relative and okay, now I'm educated. Um, it's not like that, right? So, uh, and the other, you know, theme is that they all sound good, but they can get abused, right? So again, we have the UN. And um, so we had Kant, the use of reason, and we had utilitarianism, happiness and pleasure and pain. And we had, um, and then we had moral relativism. And I think at first when you read it, it sounded pretty compelling. And then I sort of showed how actually the person who wrote that really values critical thinking. So if you think about that, you can say that Ruth Benedict claims to be a relativist, but actually she's very much an enlightenment thinker. She, she wants Americans to think critically and um, not to have prejudices and basically not to be religious but just to critique religion, uh, to get rid of all, you don't take any of that stuff seriously, right? That's just relative to, you tolerate it. That's another thing um, that the article uh, by, by, from the book Nomad, she, um, she is critical of the kind of relativism that Ruth Benedict is advocating. And, I just said, you know, that Ruth Benedict idealizes, right, these coherent societies like Islam, you know, it's a whole way of life and it has the five pillars and all this wonderful stuff. But she herself is a critical thinker and never accepts anything and is critical of her own society and does everything she can to undermine it. So, um, so, the woman who wrote the book Nomad is advocating that kind of critical thinking. She thinks it is good and it is better, but that's why Islam, religion, that stuff has got to go, but especially Islam. And she gives reasons why especially Islam. Um, so, and then on Sojourner Truth, um, I tried to, we went from relativism to the Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass because I wanted you to think about that, right? What, how unnatural slavery is because of what it does to marriage, family relations, what it does when the master, you know, rapes the slave and they have, a son has to beat his own brother. And anyway, just layers and layers that you can say this is unnatural, it's wrong, and it doesn't matter if a society normalizes it. So Sojourner Truth 
accepted it until she didn't. And so the one theme there is, can you really say certain things are wrong? Doesn't matter <laughs> where you are, who you are, any society that tries to normalize slavery is an unjust society. It's perverted, it's based on a lie. Um, and then the other thing was, what is it that drives people? Well, for Sojourner Truth, it was her idea of God or her idea of the good. So if you remember the woman who was raised with very strict fundamentalist Christianity was raised with an idea of God, but she raised her children with an idea of the good that was empathy for other people. And that was what John Stuart Mill recommended, a whole society based on empathy. And she knows that, right? She knows she's raising her kids in the John Stuart Mill mold. Okay, so Sojourner Truth had her idea of God and she gradually became more and more of a critical thinker about that idea. And so as she expanded her idea, when it got to a certain point, it was consistent with enlightenment values, okay? Um, and then Frederick Douglass, his main idea was his desire to learn to read. And so it was education that was a ticket for him. And he did acknowledge that there were times when he felt like there was a divine providence because there were things outside of his control completely that completely changed his life. So you can acknowledge that without being particularly religious and with constantly emphasizing the role of education and critical thinking. And the reason I point that out is the woman who wrote uh, Nomad actually said the same thing. She's against religion or institutionalized religion, but she does acknowledge that I can't imagine what my life would have been like if these things hadn't happened that basically I had no control over. So, so those are the sort of themes that I picked out of the readings and that's why I chose them, just so you sort of understand that there's a mind behind these assignments. <laughs> Um, so they do fit together in a certain way, but um, I do not, I like it when students pick different things than I would have picked, or they see a different pattern than I saw, like that, it's just like life, right? If you talk with somebody else about some conversation you had in the lunchroom and you talk about it two weeks later, they will have gotten something way different out of it than you did. So this is kind of also practice for life that you have to accept the fact that people learn different things, but you can also examine your mind and say, am I really being fair or am I just driving everything into these narrow categories and ignoring a whole lot else that's out there? Um, am I threatened when somebody interprets it differently? Or can I spot certain interpretations that simply aren't fair, right? They're, they're very much motivated by a desire for ignorance, right? A desire to legitimize some agenda rather than to actually seek the truth, right? Are there ways of interpreting uh, life conversations that are not intellectually honest? People are arrogant. They claim to know what they don't know. They have willed ignorance, right? There's ways to spot stuff and then examine yourself. But in general, it should be a creative process and you can pick out whatever you like. Um, so I'm going to start with Amal and just ask her, first we'll do the easy, you know, the easier one. Again, the readings were long 
And so you didn't have to read the whole thing, but they were easy, especially the dancing in the mosque. So I thought you might get, get into it, right? Um, but if not, I made an outline of that reading. Um, I think I emphasized that I did want you to read the 13 pages in the Nomad. But why don't we start again with Amal? And um, you can, what was your reaction to dancing in the mosque? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I actually just skimmed the reading on Nomad. Yeah. The uh, oh, okay. So you only read the Nomad? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's okay. At least you read it, and that's the more important one. So, Ashlyn, did you read the mosque? She disappeared. <laughs> I don't know. Her machine must have collapsed right at a very opportune moment. Is she there? No. Um, Diana. Yes, uh, Professor. So I went through that book and I read that. So the first thing when I was reading the Homaira's story, so I was feeling like it is, it is uh, the same situation that currently what is going on in Afghanistan. So around uh, half of the provinces are under the control of Taliban right now. And every day they are destroying the pillar of the lights. And that's why we don't have electricity. And these days, uh, it's become the second week that in 24 hours, we are having only 40 minutes electricity or one hour that we cannot do anything at all. So when I was reading the story, so it was coming to my mind that Am I going to the same story that what Humaira written in, in her story? And it was very uh, dangerous for me. And it was, I was feeling very nervous and very um, worried about my future that what will happen in my future? Would I be the same as Humaira is today? And am I going to the days of the fairs that people was even not allowed to go on the street without any mahram? Or will I go to the days that I will be worried that am I not able to continue my education? So these fairs was coming to my mind and it is really scary. And when I thought uh, to relate this situation to the to this course. So I was thinking that all the people already, when I came from the Bang from Bangladesh, when I came to Afghanistan this last, uh, last year, this time. So I was thinking when I was realizing the mental of my people. So every people is so aggressive, men, women, children, youth people, all are so aggressive in the, in the first stage, they will start uh, agreement, uh, uh, the controversy or these things with you. They will not behave so softly. So this all is because of Taliban war or the civil war that our people have gone through and every day they are losing their lives. So these all things will affect their mental and they cannot be normal. They cannot behave normally. So it is very, it is very scary. And I was feeling worried but at first when I was uh, declared my minor, so I was thinking that I'm going in a way that I can help my people to uh, have their normal mental. But when uh, the uh, NATO announced that they will leave Afghanistan in coming July, so I, my idea was opposite that, will we go to the back that we have passed those days? So it's still that points are in my mind. And I'm thinking about the society, especially the women, because, because it is really bad things that they are doing, especially the women, even the agreements the, in Qatar that that is going on for the peace, still they mention those things that they did in the past. 
They said that women needs to wear burqa. They needs to go. They are not allowed to go outside without any mahram. That Humaira also mentioned these things. So the same things they mentioned uh, in the announcement of peace. So I was thinking, and a lots of scary things was coming to my mind when I was reading the article, and um, okay. especially okay. the women's rule and their mental, and that how. Uh, how much of the women died during the Taliban war and because of no, no uh, health services and this all. So uh, lots of bad things was coming to my mind, but still I'm hoping for the best and for a peace Afghan uh, peaceful Afghanistan. So these all oh, things was coming to my yeah, mind. Yeah, okay. So a couple other things that I was thinking was, um, that I do want AUW students to think of themselves as a sisterhood, right? Where the women yeah. have solidarity with each other. And so in a reading like this, right? At least, yeah, yeah. you know, we can let the students in Afghanistan know, you know, the other students can let them know that we're supporting them and we're thinking about them and we care about them. And then the other thing was, um, that was why I, you know, I guess I know that some students complain about me in um, chats. And I was thinking, I, I thought about this reading, like I'm just trying to help them like learn to read and write, you know, so they can get out. And um, so I hope maybe some of you will think twice. I can't think of anything else I can do to help you get through the class. Um, but I, you know, I was always thinking about this, like it's so important that they learn, you know, that they learn that they come prepared to class. So they have to read and they have to write because that's the ticket out. So I was also thinking of that, that I don't mean to make your life miserable. <laughs> I just, ah, you know, <laughs> I, I just totally want to give you these tools, the same tools that she was giving these little kids, right? Yeah. Um, so, and I don't know which students are complaining. I guess I know there are some, but it's kind of, it's just, it's a little bit disappointing because, because they, all you do is hurt yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And I can understand that it's maybe motivated by stress or fear. But if you could stand back and say, yeah, that's not her goal, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the last thing, Diana, um, people are aggressive. That can go back if you want to go. Again, there's an extra credit place. If you want to do anything extra credit because your experience, you know, would motivate you to write something other than what I assigned. But um, like the situation of anger, anger is based on fear, right? It's a reaction to fear. So the reason why everybody's so aggressive and angry and high spirited is because it's really, the real driver is fear. Does that make sense? Um, yes, Professor, I do agree with that. And really these all pressures and losing their blood once every day and these all things put them in aggressiveness actually our people are very kind very soft-hearted but because of the situation they become changed actually the situation has changed them and i can see and i can realize that uh the situation the bad situation can change people and can bring aggressiveness on them. They are only reacting on the situation without realizing what what is happening in our mental. Right. Again, it only hurts them and it hurts, you know, other the people that they care about. So it's exactly. kind of self-destructive, you know, mm -hmm. unless you can think about it and step back and avoid getting sucked into, you know, this sort of uh, whole, you know, going down. Um, the best way to oppress people is to just punch some buttons and then let them destroy each other, right? Um, you can do that with women uh, and any kind of minority. Get them to attack each other and then you can sit back, you know, and don't get blamed. So 
yeah, I would, if you want to write any, any more about that, right? Um, you could do extra credit, linking that back to Aristotle or whatever. Because people, yeah, sure. people do say about Aristotle, which is legitimate, that this sounds great, but it sure helps if you have privilege, right? It helps if you're not starving. It helps if you're not, you know, worried about your life. You can hit the mean between extremes, right? So in some ways it's um, biased, but in other ways it tells you the goal that people should have enough stability so that they can have time to reflect because they can't be fully human if they have to just react to things. That's a lower level. That's making them a lot more like animals that just react because, right? Um, anyway, so I, got, I guess we have to move on. But yeah, Diana, that was the kind of thing I was thinking there must be some students out there. <laughs> that would be, uh, have that kind of reaction. Um, so uh, Falak, are you there? Okay, Ashlyn, go ahead. Um, professor, I just read the book Nomad only. Oh, okay. All right, well, I'll catch you. I'll catch you then. Um, Falak, did you, read, did you read this book? I guess yes. that was Falak professor who told that. Oh, that was Falak who said that. Okay, Ashlyn. Uh, so, uh, yes, professor, uh, when I went through the dancing in the mosque extract, so some of the uh, terms were not clear to me because they have used uh, some words which, which was not clear to me. And what the overall idea I got is that until and unless the people are oppressed, like the women are oppressed in a particular cultural thing where they use uh, religion as a tool uh, to kind of control them, uh, even if they want to question or reason or ask for their freedom, it, it would be a very difficult thing for them to do because religion is such a sensitive issue. And I just wanted to connect one of the ideas, like uh, as D uh, Diana told one of the ideas. So when we had this discussion about Aristotle's virtue, about the uh, uh, anger is the reaction of fear. So one of the breakout rooms when we had um, in the uh, past weeks, so she told that the behavior, like uh, the people in Afghanistan, they are uh, very, influenced by the situations that they are being like the war um, uh, in Afghanistan affected their behavior a lot. She told the same in the breakout room. I remember when she was speaking, it's like uh, people are nice in themselves, but when they comes to when sorry, when they come to some situation where they are exposed to this war and every kind of things that indirectly or directly without their conscience is affecting their behavior like that fear of being you know, the reaction to fear is coming out as anger and they are very sensitive to situations. So I guess the when they are exposed to such a cultural setting and they are not uh, being able to uh, question or reason what they are going through, I guess that actually affects their idea of being a healthy psyche because they are under a, uh, under a Hulk influential system. So uh, again, I just wanted to connect it to the nomad, uh, the nomad reading. I'll just connect the general idea. When she was exposed to a lot of culture, she could understand. There is one sentence I'll repeat again in the next discussion. Um, so uh, when she was uh, uh, starting to ask question and when she started reasoning, when she was exposed to like very different cultural context, she understood that what she was brought up or the Islamic concept is not good for her healthy psyche. So once when she started in a in different cultural exposure and when she started reasoning, that made her think all oh, yeah, what I was taught and everything, what I was being is completely wrong or I have to start questioning it. So what I felt is AUW made like people, I, I'm not experienced about what they have been like the Afghanistan students have been experiencing about. So once when they start to, uh, uh, get exposed to a very cultural, you know, um, 
uh, cultural, you know, the, which has a lot of culture in it. And when they started reasoning and when they started questioning themselves, they could understand yeah, uh, that, yeah, there is a chance of them to come out of the situation that they were. So I guess this uh, intercultural exposure and their ability to reason and question are two key factors that will help every people, not Afghan people in general, every people to come out of the situation in a, that they were oppressed before. So that's some of the general ideas I got. Okay, that's great. I um, Yeah, so AUW has this liberal arts education model and that is a Western model, right? And so again, I've read a lot of your posts and students um, are different in how much they're going to embrace or change what they grew up with. Um, and to me, it's entirely up to you. But, but as a philosophy class, you know, I unite reason and faith and I explain why, because if you separate them, you're going to get, you're going to lose a free and open society because in the name of religion, you can do anything. And that, that's just true. <laughs> and I think the people who separate them would never send their daughters to AUW, I don't think, right? <laughs> so I do think, you know, that, that that's not, shouldn't be too offensive a foundation. And it does have a good reason. And then for you just to realize what's going on in your psyche, right? Like there are different bells and whistles that are actually being triggered, <laughs> right? You aren't just studying it, you're actually doing it. Uh, that's what I want you to understand. Yeah. Um, Aurora, what about you? Yes, Professor. I just read the chapter six name during in the mosque, dancing in the mosque. Okay. So here I got uh, mainly uh, during the civil war, a girl's feelings are expressed that she couldn't accept this injustice, that she couldn't accept that formal education would be stopped. Then she started a great work of educating the girls around her on her own initiative. Here, people are brutally tortured in the name of Islam and their right to formal education is taken away. That's right. Okay. Um, all right. Sounds good. Uh, Ratika, what you got? Uh, yes, Professor. Like uh, I went through uh, the first few pages, like where I got that they are living in fear. Uh, and even after that, they are very much brave to face each and every issues which are going around them. And like, I can't really relate with that, but it makes me feel that uh, Muslim women are very strong. Okay. Can you say they're courageous, right? That is what courage, that's a really, mm. it's a better idea of courage than just going out and fighting in a battle and killing somebody, right? Uh, mm. That you have moral courage, that you have the courage of your, to speak out that, so yeah, I do think women are, you know, in a lot of ways, at least as courageous as men, uh, maybe more so, but they don't get the credit for it, right? The notion of a hero is always some kind of soldier and it's usually a guy, right? Does that make sense to you, Ritika? Yes, Professor. Okay, good. Um, new chat? Hi, Professor. Hello. Okay, so first thing that I want to point out is um, about Nana Jan. So, there was a there is a constant war going on but in the midst of the fear of war that all have she is she is having the fear of god she even uh, it was mentioned at one point that when uh, the attack starts she uh, tights uh, makes her scarf a little tighter so that it doesn't um, fly away because like that's because she thinks that she doesn't want to die without her scarf on <laughs> so we, and also in sojourner truth we saw how 
fear of uh, when uh, someone is in uh, helpless situation we start believing and get dependent more on god and we um, pray and hope that some um, god, uh, god will save us um, uh, and ideas like that so i think pe- um, people in afghanistan if i think logically i or in this way i think people in afghanistan tend to be more religious because they have constant wars going on in their country and secondly um i was so shocked when i was reading all those things i i was constantly having goosebumps thinking that a child is growing up in such an environment where um well war bloodshed bullets tanks are so much normal to her it's always in um in front of her eyesight and what will happen through this is it will get very normalized these all of these negative things will get very normalized and uh, there is a chance that when children um, grow up like this or uh, when they will become adult they will it will be difficult for them to process their emotions because they have already seen so much in their childhood so much aggression so much um, cruelty that their mind will also become very uh, um, strong and they will not be able to feel things so yeah these are the things that that i got from the okay reading. good very good so that goes back to the blank slate right like John Stuart Mill admits that socialization is powerful, but ultimately certain ways a kid grows up that gets normalized is still wrong, right? It's still perverted. It's still unhealthy, no matter how, no, no, no matter how scary it is that people can get to thinking things like that are normal, like slavery is normal, right? So that's why the critical thinking uh, is important. But yeah, you're right. I mean, anytime you look at a little kid, you know how vulnerable they are. The other thing that I think of, if you ever see a child holding their parent's hand and they just so innocently trust that parent and what happens when that parent is not trustworthy, right? Or they think their parents know everything. What happens when they find out my parents don't know everything and my parents can't protect me from things, right? It's just kind of sad because the parents want to be able to, to you know, know everything and protect them and they can't, but they can't tell them that. They just have to hold their hand and you know, it. I guess it drives me nuts because I remember that so vividly. And my kids, my grandkids are that age now, right? There's just complete trust. And we can't, we can't protect them from so much. It's kind of sad. Uh, okay. Um, Masoma, what about you? Uh, professor, I didn't read uh, the book Dancing and Nomad, uh, uh, Dancing and Mask, but then I read Nomad. Okay. But then, Professor, I have a general idea <clears throat> because before, like, uh, coming to this book, I, you know, uh, I heard about this book and then I, I watched Umaira's interview. Um, no. I think it was three months ago uh, when he was giving a speech about her book. So yeah, uh, I have a general idea what is written in the book. So, Professor, what uh, you know, what amazed me uh, when Humaira was talking about his book, like you know, she t- she talked about her personal uh, life uh, and uh, how much obstacles she faced, right, as a mother and as a girl in Afghanistan. But then, yeah, or even as a wife. But then, <clears throat> yeah, Professor, I uh, what like you know, encouraged me like he come up to, uh, I mean, like she come up to this value of you know. Uh, educating people so because she was educating small girls in mask right and then yeah it I mean it, it maybe this was the reason that he come out from all this obstacle I mean he sucks you know to get her son uh, and all so yeah I think education is the way for women okay good and that's the theme right of uh, Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, in a lot of ways, became self-educated. 
Um, okay, so Rita, are you there? Yes, Professor. Uh, professor, sorry, I didn't read the uh, Dancing in the Moss, but I, I did read the Nomad one. Okay, so I'll write that down and I'll call on you when we get there. Um, yes, professor. Saida? Okay, uh, go ahead and put in the chat something. So I just know that you, you know, you didn't just turn on your machine. And again, I understand that it might have gotten disconnected and everything. So I'll just keep checking. Um, if you're not there for the whole three hours, then um, you'll just, you know, you'll have to look at the video, whatever. But anyway, okay, Aisha, what have you got? Aisha? Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Barely. You can talk louder. Professor, can you please give me one minute? Then I will be logging from my phone. Uh, it's still pretty hard to hear. Professor, she asked uh, to give her some time so that she'll join oh, from her. Okay, phone. okay. So, how about I'll do Pooja right now? Hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, uh, so, I I found that Nomad Nomads one like the paper very interesting and was going through it. So I found two of the statements which were uh, connected to our own life. So one was like um, many circumstances and decisions in our life are not controllable and only uh, we see the opportunities that are not allowed to take uh, control of control in our life so what i want uh, i mean connecting it to my personal uh, experience it kind of matches because like many of the decisions in my life uh, have not been taken by me so it is like a, i feel like it's it's a destiny that connects me to take the decisions that we're not uh, supposed to be. For example, uh, going to AUW and taking uh, my bachelor's from, I mean, undergraduate from there was not a decision that uh, I chose for myself. It was like, I have to take a decision that I have to go and I didn't have any options to do that. I mean, rather that, so I went there. Uh, so I felt like, yes, that statement was quite relatable to my life. Another, uh, another uh, um, statement was like uh, the, about the suffering that, uh, I mean, like many people's needs and need and they sacrificed for their, uh, for the peace of the mind of family, siblings, and some for the friends. And I was like, yes, we need to take some decisions uh, where we need to suffer for only for like family or like siblings. Uh, because uh, I being an elder daughter in my family, I try to make other happy be rather being own happy I'm, or happiness because I always try like, okay, if I, for example, if I take person's classes and if I earn some money from that, I prefer making my family or my siblings happy because they are demanding. They were like, I need uh, some kind of stuff. And when you get the salary, please give me. And something like that, it it connects. Like I try to find, I, I always try like, for example, okay, this time I'm gonna buy this for me, but like when I hear from the family perspective or sibling's perspective, I feel like let's do for them, not for me now. So I find it very interesting when I was going through it. Okay, okay. Um, Aisha, what you got? Uh, hi, Professor. Sorry for the interruption. Actually, my laptop, uh, you know, the connection is not good. Okay, uh, so I actually read Nomad uh, and uh, for the Dancing in the Moss. 
I tried to read chapter six. I couldn't complete, but whatever I um, read, I felt like, you know, I felt the, how to say, I mean, something is going on. The war is going to start in their place and the trauma and the, the stigmatization of that event. I mean, everything, it was um, kind of uh, something so scary. And after that, you know, uh, what is it called? Ma mother. Uh, so she was the one who was motivating uh, the author that you should be you should be changing yeah. your attitude. So that line actually hit me. Like among all the frustrations, all the depressions, and like standing forward, it's it takes a lot of courage. And yeah, it it's something that we need to work on and. We need to actually change our habits and I mean the individual habits or the attitudes and after that everything will come forth. That's what it is. I couldn't complete. That's why I cannot turn into a con conclusion right now. But uh, yeah, that's what I have for now. Okay. So I so again, I understand that education online is pretty horrible, but I hope maybe this reading this will at least make you more determined. Like... <laughs> But it's education, you know, and it's, it's a good kind education. Of an inspiration. Yeah. What? It's kind of an inspiration. I mean, we are kind of, you know, we are having so many uh, complaints that we, uh, we don't have this much. We don't have that much uh, in case of online education. I mean, but uh, if we think about their uh, point of views, I mean, their situation, it's nothing, actually, nothing compared to that. Yeah. Yeah, you just piece together, right? What is the best education I can get under these circumstances? That would be, that would be the question that you'd always ask yourself, right? Um, uh, yeah. Right, and I, I hope that you understand that I ask myself, well, what is the best education I can give, right, under these circumstances? Like, I can't do it the way I did it when we were together, Aisha, but it's just always a question of, well, well what can I do, right? And so, um, yeah, I hope so. Anyway, the posts, there's a lot of them coming in really nicely, and I'm not a, a hard grader. Um, so it's just a matter of getting the work done. But Christina, have you got something on the book Dancing in the Moth? Okay. So we'll see. Um, okay, so let me just go to the outline that I did. Um, just, you know, today, again, I would have sent it earlier, but I'm like going by the seat of my pants, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't, but at least it's fresh on my mind. So here's what's really interesting. Again, this is so, if you just think of how dependent you are and the various things that have gotten you to this point, some of which are under your control and some of which are not. And then the nomad thing is really emphasizes the influence of family. So right here, right? The Taliban comes in. Um, Okay, Ashlyn, go ahead. Uh, sorry for the interruption, Professor. I don't know if it's just for me. When I open the outline, it's just a plain sheet for me. I don't know. Oh, I can't can you, really can you scroll out. up? Can you scroll up? Because the second sheet might be empty. Yeah. No? It was also the same for me, Professor. Yeah, so, same for me. Professor. Oh, why would that be? Yeah, same for me also. I don't know, Professor. It's blank. Okay, so let me try sharing some other. Let me try looking at. Oh, all right. Oh, here, let me try this. Um, yeah. Oh, ahead. that's the problem. Okay. Um, all right, so it'll take me a, uh, a minute to move something, right, from one place to another. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, so 
I'm going to edit this. Well, thanks for telling me and thanks for, you know, raising your hands. Like if something like that happens, everybody raise their hand at once and then maybe you'll get my attention. I'll stop talking. Um, well, I want to, okay, we'll try again with this one. I think this was the one I put up there before though. So I might've, um, you know, messed, messed things up, but let's see. Nope, okay, so that's part of the problem. Um, uh, how come? This one is right in front of me though. So, uh, hmm. so you can't see that one, is that right? It's just odd. Okay. Officer, we can we can see your screen and the outline. Maybe you can post it later. Yeah. I can see what? Okay. Why yeah, we can see the screen. You can see it? We can see, Professor, the outline. <laughs> Did you say can or cannot? Can, Professor, not. I can't. I mean, it's visible, visible. <laughs> you can? Okay. Yeah. How many people? So everyone can see it now? You mean the screen you're sharing, Professor? Yeah. We're, yeah we yeah, can we only can see, see in the screen. No, oh. the dancing is the most material. We can see it right now, but it's not shared in the Google Classroom. That's what I was telling. When we see the Google Classroom thing, it's just a blank sheet. Okay, okay. Actually, I just posted two of them, and the second one is this one. So, do you want me to? Okay. Anyway, let's just share the screen, and then I'll I'll do that during the ten minute break. Okay. Okay. So this is the thing that's interesting, and it and I hope you can think about you know all those things that happened to you in your past that sort of got you to this point. And if there's anything you can do to give back, right? So here she is, she's 13 years old. The Taliban takes over and shuts down women's rights. Like you can't go out of the house, blah, blah. Her mother, right? Okay, think of how many other young women's mothers just told them put up and shut up, right? And her mother was the one she said, I don't want you to spend your life crying like I do. And then you have to be more active. You have to, you know, go from passive to active. That's the theme, right? Don't react, be creative, act. And so create something, start something. And so she suggests that teaching the kids to read. And so yay for her mother, right? And I do think a number of you have, I've, you know, the students have told their stories. Some of, there's some adult that obviously thinks it's okay for them to be there or they wouldn't be there, right? So some of the students, it's their dad that wanted them to go to college. Some, it's their mother. Some, so, I mean, it's just interesting. And we, we're all in the same boat in terms of depending upon our parents. And so it is, it's amazing that anybody can be a parent and nobody, you know, ever, there's very little questioning of how kids get treated, which John Stuart Mill is really worried about, right? But everyone's totally offended by that. You can't come in there and take my kid away, but it makes so much difference to the child. Then the Taliban, where do they get all their money? And so they're going to have a lot of money Okay, the next thing is that people called it the wrath of God. So you can imagine people saying, oh, the reason was that Afghan women were starting to become doctors and they were getting educated and God, you know, God is condemning us. That's what happened in the U.S. The, um, when 9-11 when happened, 
there were a bunch of ministers that said, God allowed this to happen because our country was getting taken over by the feminists and the gays and the liberals and the humanists. <laughs> so, you know, the U.S. is not that far ahead, right? It's the same pattern. It's, oh, it's really scary, right? All the science in the world isn't going to help people grow up emotionally. Um, so then the refugees came and they were living in tents. And so then she started teaching in this mosque tent and boys came. Um, so the personality of this person who wrote the book, she is really uppity, right? She's very assertive. Uh, again, starting with her mom. I think if she knew her mother was behind, you know, behind her and supporting her, I think it gave her a lot of strength. Um, and then it's somewhat confusing, but she eventually she was in the Netherlands. She got married. The guy said that he, he was so happy he was married to a progressive woman. Then he wanted to go back and he told her to shut up when she got there. He said, everybody's telling me I don't know how to control my wife and you have to do this and you have to do that. And finally, you know, he got himself a younger woman, a second wife, because it can have up to four wives. And so then she decided to leave and she had to leave her son. And um, so she's writing this letter to her son. And, and if you read the rest of the chapters, I mean, it's really, really sad. They will not allow her to send a picture he, he has never seen a picture of his mother and they won't send her a picture of her son, right? Not nothing. And so she's just writing this letter, um, hoping that someday, right, he'll understand and he'll have some knowledge of his mother. Right now, he's getting totally indoctrinated uh, by this belief that his mother was wicked. So... Anyway, the, the second chapter is about the bathhouse. So um, the Taliban came and then the girls were all falling back into these old patterns of just being petty. She you know, gave them a little sermon about the importance of education. Eventually the Taliban will be gone and where will you be? You'll have nothing. So they agreed to come to a demonstration she, you know, she's the only one that spoke up. Only 10 people came and uh, the bathhouse got closed. Then that while she's teaching in this tent mosque, um, they did the Taliban. I mean, they danced in the mosque. There's that story. But he entered the mosque and he was suspicious because they told him, we're just teaching the Quran. Uh, and she was actually sexually attracted to one of them. And then she, you know, she told her friend about this guy. And this is another thing that happens a lot. Like not all Taliban are bad. The BBC just says they're all bad. They don't know the hearts of everyone. He knew she was teaching literacy. He wanted to learn to read because he wanted to write a letter to his mother, right? And so, she talks about the ugly face of religion and politics. So, um, so you should think about this claim. This was um, Ataturk, the Turkish guy. He said, when you unite religion and politics, it corrupts religion and it corrupts politics. So you should think about that. It's, you know, it, it just puts in a nutshell these patterns that happen. Um, the Russians killed his brother. His friend wanted to learn to read. The Taliban banned TV books. Okay, her dad buried his books in the backyard and dug them up every year so they would dry out. So she finally convinced her dad to keep some of them in the cellar. She read them at night and she started writing stories. Um, 
The Taliban guy got sick. She brought him some soup. He was sent to the war front and then he was killed. And then there's the letter to her son. She explains why she decided to leave him. Her books are considered shameful and she's hoping that maybe someday her son will not think of her books as shameful. Um, and then the last chapter was this, um, her reading in the cellar and, and she read these books about Russia. It was an entirely different world than the one she lived in. Um, she started writing stories. She remembered some girls in a book club and she went out to try and find that girl. And she asked this man fix, fixing a bicycle. And just because there's a woman on the street, he starts sexually, um, had sexual innuendo later on. He sexually assaulted her. Um, a professor agreed to meet with them once a week to get critiques of their stories. He brought the stories to the literary society. The newspaper published her story the first time without her name. Um, she, this old family friend became a Taliban and he tried to rape her and she literally bit off his fingers. <laughs> I can't believe she got didn't get in trouble for that. And then her second story was published with her name on it, which like, why did they do that? The Taliban wanted her publicly whipped. Her dad bought all the newspapers, buried some of them and burned the rest. So they, they showed the Taliban, oh yeah, we're burning this. We don't believe in this. So, um, and then the letter to her son. So, so that was, those were, I just picked some chapters where education is, is the key. And yet it's so difficult, right? For her to, to get an education. So I will, um, um, I'll give you a 10 minute break. And why don't I leave, I'll just leave that uh, outline on the screen share. Let's see, just in case, whoops, <laughs> not this. Um, in case you wanted to um, take some, do some homework during the 10 minute break, you can do that. But otherwise uh, we'll be back at 18 minutes after the hour. Okay. All right. Oh, let me make sure that you can. Um, that you have access to the. Um, oh, I'll pause the recording. All right. So here's the outline I have so far. Um, and then I'll start calling on students who just did the nomad. We'll start with them. And then we'll go back. Okay, she was born in Somalia in 1969. This one was Afghanistan, 1981. So uh, 12 years difference. Her father was jailed for his role in the political opposition. So then they were in exile. Their family went to Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Kenya. Her mother was the fervent Muslim. Okay, so this would be different, I think. Father left Kenya and his family and she didn't see him for 10 years. And with the help of a teacher and her mother, I guess she became a fervent Muslim. Uh, then her father ordered her to marry a relative in Canada. And on the way to Canada, the plane stopped in Germany and she decided to take a train to the Netherlands. Um, and she found the Dutch people were really tolerant and she wanted to study political science to find out why Dutch society, even though the people were godless, they were wonderful, right? They had these virtues. They were flourishing while the societies I'd been in were Muslim, but terrible, right? People were not exercising those virtues. Um, so she said, I teetered between the clear ideals of the enlightenment. Now, hopefully by now, you know what that's about, right? We've read a lot of that. The uh, utilitarianism, Kant, 
I had you reading Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment? I had you reading John Stuart Mill's excerpts, you know, outline about the free and open society. So that's what she's talking about. Um, let's see. She, she teetered between that and her submission to the dictates of Allah, right? And then in 9-11, she, when Osama bin Laden, uh, what, bombed the Twin Towers, he used quotes in the Quran to justify the destruction of innocent life. And she realized that, yeah, there are quotes in there. And so she quit being a Muslim. So she's an atheist. Um, I spoke out and then there were death threats. She ran for the Dutch parliament. She was elected on the Dutch parliament, which shows you, you know, how tolerant the Dutch are, how much they want the Muslims to assimilate into their society. She made a movie about how Islam crushes women. She made it with Theo van Gogh, who is the grandson, great grandson of a famous painter, um, he was assassinated by a Muslim fanatic that was born in Amsterdam. And so she's trying to say, look, guys, you're creating fanatics right here, right? They aren't coming in fanatic. The way you treat the Muslim refugees is creating more fanatics. So she wants that her book is about that. Um, so she said, my first book was about my physical journey. This book is about my mental journey, which is a distinction, again, we made in Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass. And what she's, her main theme in this book is this clash of civilizations. Her extended family lives in the US, but they never gave up on Islam and they're all very dysfunctional. The dysfunctional Muslim family constitutes a real threat to the fabric of Western life. The family is a crucible of human value. This is where your cycle of loyalties is established and your passion and your passions. And it's passed on to future generations. The dynamics of the Muslim family tends to make young Muslim men um, drawn to Islamic radicalism, uh, partly because excuse me, because they have such absolute power over women at home. So there's a minority of Muslims who think Islam is under siege and is committed to winning the holy war against the West. But there's another group of Muslims that's convinced that when the, these radicals uh, perform acts of terror, that it will trigger a Western backlash against all Muslims. So they're afraid they have a persecution complex. So then they want to hang together in ghettos, Muslim ghettos, and they tell their children not to have anything to do with the West. Um, and then she just talks, she refers to what she talks about in the book. Her parents didn't relate to each other their expectations for their children were tyrannical. Their philosophy of parenting was bad. They had conflicted views towards sex, money, and violence. And she's emphasizing that religion plays a role in all of this stuff. Um, and then I did quote, there were so many circumstances in my life that weren't in my control. Only in hindsight do I see the opportunities that allow me to take control of my life. So that's all the further I got, but that's okay. Then uh, I'll talk about the rest of it in a, after all of you have spoken. But um, so why don't we start out with Amal? What did you get from the book Nomad? Okay, so I was, uh, when I was reading what, what stuck in my mind, was about talking about refugees, and uh, yeah, I actually like can relate it to that uh, about the obstacles that because like most of the refugees are Muslims uh, that flee uh, like to uh, Europe or uh, like to the Western world, 
and they're still suffering in what she uh, called the racism of low expectation. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was that I found it, uh, you know, interesting to talk about because like the refugees are going to, uh, to those countries to get better life, not to, you know, uh, suffer from these obstacles and uh, not to be, you know, treated as minorities and uh, yet to, to perceive uh, to, per, to be perceived in that way. Um, I want to also mention that uh, when she talked about the uh, the obstacles that women suffer, and she divided like in three ways: the sex, money, and violence. So women are treated like and expect to be submissive and also not uh, having control you know of her financial uh, life and also the violence and which was the third obstacle um, then the remedies that she suggested was uh, like the, uh, to have public education and feminist movement like uh, in Europe, uh, there's this enlightenment and all, right? But they're always like considerate of these uh, people. Not, I mean, like uh, they claim to be, uh, you know, how do I start it out? Like they, cl they claim to be, uh, accept that they don't accept it, but they say that they are considerate of other characters, of people from other backgrounds or, um, yeah, I can reflect that uh, like to what um, refugees like from Syria are are going through in these countries. So yeah, that's what I was what what I found it, uh, in, like interesting in this reading. Unfortunately. So what do you know about the refugees in Syria and their experience in the West? Um, I what I see and hear like from my friends there. They, they go through like you, like you, there's always difficulty because they suffer from you know the racism. Uh, like wherever they go, they they're not expected to, um, you you know they, they as she said like they're not uh, they have you know this uh, normal standard of behavior. So I guess like they're always um, prejudiced. Okay, um, so are they not expected to assimilate? Um, how was that? Are they, um, she said that they're allowed to live in their ghettos and they, they can treat women however they want as a matter of respect for other cultures. And um, so I'm wondering if your friends have that, like, they're living in the West, but they're within their family. They're getting treated in ways that. Yeah. Um, is that true? Uh, I guess like in some cases, yeah. So the Westerners just allow them within their family to do whatever they want. Um. Like, no, like they don't allow, the, like, uh, like at the end that they have to follow their rules and their what they are expecting them to do. So when they deviate from that, I am, um, and you know, practice like what uh, in their families, I like I have to think about that. And yeah, okay, because he uh, says things like they need to get sex ed. They need to have birth control. They need to, right? And there's yeah. lots of stuff that would go against a whole lot of Muslim customs, right? Yes. And I'm just wondering, yeah, she's sort of on the other extreme, right? Sorry, if you live here, this, 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 right? You can't wear a burqa. That's what the French did, right? You have to do this. You can't do that. And so she, her experience was the other way. Oh, you can do whatever you want. And then these, you don't have to send your daughters to school or they can just go to Muslim school. 
And so it seems like there's just a whole lot of stuff going on. Does that make sense, Amal? Uh, yeah. I can mention like a recent thing that happened in, in France uh, where like, I don't know if you know about it, but uh, like girls were uh, like expected not to wear hijab just right. Uh, but but in France, but, but I think this is their religion. Like like what they teach in France, that there is this enlightenment and there is this idea uh, of freedom and you know to practice your religion. But uh, at the same time, they were against hijab and yeah. I guess that was a reason that I can. Is that relatable? Well, yeah, that's the most obvious one, and that's an old one. So I'm just wondering. In the schools, do they have to learn about the Enlightenment, or do, are the, the students allowed to go to Muslim schools and learn whatever the Muslims want to teach them? Right. Um, that uh, I don't know, and I was wondering if you knew that, based on your friends and your, you know, what you hear. Um, so you don't know. No, because like, uh, I don't think they went, uh, like they're not, uh, I, I mean, like they're not that uh, in religion and they're not that religious. So I, ca I cannot refer, like get um, uh, like, what you, like what you're asking for, like from the experiences that they had. But I guess for other people, they, um, other refugees and other Muslim uh, people there, like, yeah, they had this. It probably very black, yeah. Um, so let's see, let me go to, um, who else? Falak. Yes, Professor. Sorry, uh, Professor. Sorry for interruption. Oh, yeah? Uh, professor, I just wanted to inform you that my Wi-Fi battery is half and I have another class too. So I need to uh, leave this class too that I can attend my another oh, class. Okay. All right. So you can Thank watch, you, Professor, you can for watch, concentration. Sure. You can watch me, watch it on the YouTube then. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah yes, okay. Professor. All right. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Okay, Falak, what you got? Yeah, um, so this book is about her transition from a tribal mindset that restricts women's every thought and action to a life as a free and equal citizen in an open society. She shows how Western values contradict with Islamic values. Also, uh, she mentions three obstacles to the integration of people and one among, one among them was the um, Islam's treatment of women. But you know, one has to distinguish between the Islam and the culture. Some cultures do consider women as robots who serve them as cleaners and cooks, um, but not every Muslim thinks the same. Also, um, nothing like this is mentioned in the Quran about women. So a person needs to unite a reason with faith so that they can stop discriminating against women and um, stop being narrow-minded. Yeah, okay. that's it. Okay. So you think it's possible to be faithful to Islam and to have the equality of yeah, women? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, who else? Let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, Rita. Hello, Professor. Uh, so when I read the book, uh, I found this really interesting. When it says uh, she was... 22 years old and her father ordered her to marry her relative. So instead of going to Canada, she took a train to Holland. And I think it was very brave of her. And it, if I were her, I would also do the same because no one can force me to marry. And I also think that in her stories, her father seems very strict because it used the, the word order. So I think he didn't really apply the real Islamic values because as I know, um, in Islam, arranged marriage is good if it's not forced. But here in in this uh, in her stories, uh, she use uh, it use the word order instead of suggest. Okay. Um, yeah. Actually, I have an AW 
AUW student last semester said she was getting forced to get married. And five days before the wedding, she was accepted into some leadership program and she took a plane and left. So, <laughs> uh, so good for her. <laughs> I, I don't know how she, how it is. It hasn't caught up with her yet, but um, anyway, yeah, it happens even to people yeah. you know. I think I think many people say that religion is bad and it prevents people from anything, but actually, it's I think it's not true. I think it's the people. I think every religion, whether it's uh, Islam or Christians or everything, I think they only teach good things for us to live in this world. Okay, so you could say there are fundamentalists in and every religion, and then there are humanists in every religion, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Asa, what you got? Asa? There she comes. Yes. So, uh, sorry for the delay. Um, okay, so, so many things I actually love from uh, that excerpt. Um, but among them, I would like to focus on one, one single line right now. So, it was, um, she mentioned that about the women who live in a tightly closed traditional Muslim culture within uh, a broadly open culture. Okay, so I found it interesting. Um, uh, it's like, um, you know, uh, the family like ours, uh, we were raised um, from our childhood like an open culture, I would say. I mean, my parents have never um, kind of confined us that you have to follow the Islamic rules to do everything. But yeah, they taught us the moral, moral values and some sort of um, things about Islam. And but the fact is, um, whenever I am going outside to mix up with the people from our society, I, it becomes a clash of the Islamic ideals and the Western ideals. I, I would say. I mean, they are kind of uh, the follower of the not all of them, but some of them, uh, like the follower of the Islamic ideals, and I mean, they are the radical followers. Yeah. So uh, and at that point of time i feel like oh my gosh so what the hell i'm doing i mean it's it comes a conflict of mind i i can say yeah that's it okay so i would imagine that a lot of the students auw maybe at least understand the conflict between religion yeah, that's true. <laughs> even if you weren't raised in that extremist islam you probably know people that were right uh, or sometimes it isn't even Islam. It's some of my students are raised in pretty extreme Hindu or um, what Christian, right? So it's just so you start recognizing the patterns and then you have to figure out, you know, what you want. Where do you want to take your stand in the middle of all this, right? Because I think at, at college is the time when you start figuring out you know at least start figuring out where you want to where you want to be um okay let me see who else um uh, masoma you said you read it right uh yes professor uh so professor i i found it like like my other classmates i also found it very interesting and then i found it related kind of uh, professor like you know uh, she was critical about the religious belief and, and, and you know, she see the difference between Western and Muslim countries. Uh, like, uh, you know, she like, this is the reason that she criticized, okay, if I am a Muslim and I believe in God, but then uh, she went to a, another country where there is no God and people, again, people is very united and c kind. Whereas in, the, in her country, like people were, you know, so corrupted. And then, uh, yeah, Professor, I, I liked the example that she used uh, that uh, when Osama bin Laden justify his 9-11 uh, attack uh, uh, by, you know, some claims uh, 
I mean by Quran, like uh, some of the claims uh, he uh, claimed was mentioned in the Quran, and then it, it makes him, it makes her uh, to you know criticize and see that okay, this is uh, she believed that her her action was uh, his action was wrong, but then you know it was mentioned in the Quran, and this is why she become critical of the Quran. That why it is the case. Maybe people are so extreme, and maybe there is something wrong with. Uh, we know with her religion and then professor i think this was good because you know uh, like sometimes you are brought up in a society no one is helping you no one is showing the way like your family accept those faith your society accept those faith you have no teacher and then you have no one to guide you but then you found your way you found you know your way by thinking so i think yeah this is very important like it is our thinking that make us you know that show us the way. So yeah, and I saw like I like what Rida mentioned that there most of the time it's like you know it's not about the Islam or religion, but it is how people you know corrupted how people misuse Islam, and how people misuse the uh, the thing mentioned in Quran. So yeah, it's like uh, I know that there are a lot of things mentioned in, in Quran and it's justify and maybe it's reasonable. But then people misuse, people, you know, take one point which are beneficial to them, but then uh, do not consider the other points. So, yeah, I think uh, this is the problem with, you know, Muslim societies. Um, I wanted to mention uh, some other things. Um, yeah, Professor, this is what. Uh, okay, so Jana Tool, do you have something? She might professor, have yeah, uh, professor. Like you know, I I like the example that she used. I mean, she she used uh, the example of her relative and his family. That uh, how was their life when they are like you know in the state and believe. So, I mean, like this. It, I mean, this is true. Like we should reflect on our life, on our people that we know that they are following certain faith, faith and how is their life? Is it miserable or is it good? Uh, or like, I mean, like maybe people, you know, questioned her that you cannot generalize everyone. Is it like your your story is, you know, related to other uh, Muslim women? I mean, it was about her other book, right? But then she give up, uh, she gives the example of her sisters and then, yeah, the, her relatives that show that it's not like only in my case, but then it's also like my, in case of my relative that they have this extreme faith which are misunderstood and corrupted and then, you know, yeah. Okay, that, so, that, that wasn't... yeah, so the thing that you can, you can use the readings I've assigned because here's what I was thinking you, you can think about this, right? So Aristotle's model of flourishing, the United Nations model of flourishing is what the, the people in the Netherlands have in mind. And their version of it is secular. But they also have in mind Ruth Benedict. Does everybody understand that? That you should tolerate other people, right? And you yeah. shouldn't be a, a bigot. And you shouldn't try to force people to become Western, right? And But on the other hand, Ruth Benedict clearly thinks that critical thinking is better than blind obedience. I hope you understand this, that- Exactly, yes, Professor. This the is same she... conflict that Benedict has is the conflict the people in the Netherlands are having. Yeah, okay. I hope all of you understand that because it just keeps recurring all the time. Um, and then the next thing would be that each of you has to ask, in her case, she decided Islam was incompatible with promoting flourishing, right? It's absolutely, there's no way. Whereas some of you are gonna disagree with her, right? So um, that's, that's for you to decide. Uh, but I do think you need to know, right? There's some people who say this is a clash of civilizations 
and Westerners are too tolerant and that's, they're gonna lose it. They're gonna lose a free and open society because they tolerated intolerance, all right? And that, I've had a lot of experience with that too because I teach a lot of students at Lyon who are intolerant and they were raised to be intolerant. Um, and the reason they came to Lyon was not because of Lyon's mission and they, do not learn anything. They don't gain tolerance while they're there. They're determined not to change their minds, which is horrible, right? This is the US and this is Christianity, but it happens everywhere. And so, so on the other hand, so I, I understand that she's been through much worse, but, um, and she does acknowledge that there are Christian fundamentalists who are more like Muslim fundamentalists. Um, and then she says that, but if you read Jesus, Jesus' teachings, it's very much the same virtues as the UN promotes, as humanism promotes. So if people who are Christian in that sense, if they're humanist Christian, they can help the Muslims because they show how you can believe in the same God, right? It's the same God um, and still love people and promote toleration and open-mindedness. So that's her idea of the direction that we should be going. Um, but let me let some other people talk. Um, let me see, let me start out. Ashlyn, let's see, I'm all spoke. Okay, Ashlyn, did you have something to say? Yes, Professor, I actually have, have written some of the points. Uh, <clears throat> so I just wanted to um, highlight the first point is, uh, she, she, just, she was just thinking, uh, what if her, her father has not left to uh, some place like uh, that, that time span actually made a crucial shift in her life. So it's like uh, she she started thinking or she uh, got that flip when her father left uh, her for some reason, right? So uh, she was just uh, thinking herself, as I have told in the last reflection, like in the last class, that obstacle or that particular situation made her think she has way more, uh, way more uh, ideas or she has way more places to come out or what she was being brought up or what she was believing that is true is not true. You have another things to uh, another things to believe or to take, you have another good things to take from the society and or, or from the world. So one of the important notes that I have taken from the reading is I described like it's a quote, I described some of the questions that formed in my mind as the baby step I took to make sense of the new world that I had entered and experiences that made me question my faith in Islam and the more of my parents obstacles that made me strong. So this is one of the um, uh, idea of one of the quotes that I want to again uh, emphasize the importance of reasoning uh, because once when she started to question, like once she started questioning and reasoning as a tool to expand her idea, that's when she came out of that very conser conservative uh, uh, environment that she was brought up. And that's when she started to understand what she actually has, what the world as a whole offers. It's not just the cultural context that she was brought up, but there are things outside of her uh, culture or outside of her country. There are things world um, offered to make her a better, like made, make her a better person and to make her a, like, which helps her to be a healthy psyche, which is our ultimate aim. And uh, okay, another thing what she mentioned is the family is very crucial of uh, human values. It is the family that are groomed 
uh, that children are groomed to practice and promote the norm of their parents' culture. So again, I uh, understood the importance of childhood conditioning, how much conditioning affects the uh, mindset or the growth of the uh, children, as I'm already, always mentioning in my post and in the classes. Like uh, in, in that particular tender age, whatever we are asked, it takes us time. It takes us a lot of time to, you know, kind of come out of that particular mindset that we were having since childhood so yeah that childhood conditioning and the importance of society like a free and open society is important to think uh, uh, important for children to think from like multiple dimensions that this is like you have a lot of opportunities to think and you have a lot of opportunities to come out of the very sophisticated or very uh, you know limited environment that you were in so that again is an important thing, I guess. Um, another thing is, okay, as Pooja already mentioned uh, in the last reflection, uh, it's like she told, I suffered many moments of weakness when I, was when I was too entertained about the idea of giving up my needs and sacrificing my personal happiness for the peace of mind of my parents, siblings, and others. So, uh, I'm, I'm kind of very um, sick of the idea that we limit ourselves in finding happiness by making others happy. So I don't know, it's, it's a bit difficult for us to find things that, it's not difficult for us to find things that make us happy, but in order to make it happen or make things happen that actually make us happy, we have to conflict the idea of many others. What makes us happy may not be the thing that completely fulfill the criteria of our parents. So I'm sick of the idea of people getting, you know, too much involved into the personal relationships than giving importance to the individual happiness, which I think will kind of hinders the idea of again, becoming a healthy psyche. Um, and yeah, as Amal already mentioned, one of the remedies that she uh, told in the um, in the uh, in the article is about the public um, education so what she has written is children from all social backgrounds were not only taught about taught about math geography science and acts but also uh, they were taught about the discipline required to achieve success and to kind of having empathy towards others so uh, what i felt is since childhood we were given education we know how to uh, you know empathize other situation or how to see others from in from their shoes or to understand what they are going through so i guess education in that play, uh, in that terms plays an important role so as uh, we already we can we all will agree education and reasoning are two main uh, key factors that will help us to achieve our ultimate goal of being happy and becoming a healthy psych okay a lot. so um so the idea there is that when you get to a certain age, it really is a natural capacity to think critically. It's not uh, strictly socially constructed. It's just a society that nurtures that is a society that actually is based on human nature, right? Yeah. That it's natural for us to ask why, and it's natural for us to seek reasons. And then societies that try to socialize people never to ask, right? To live only by habit and imitation, which is what children do, is a, is a crippled society, right? It's an inferior society. That's why um, when you talk about the racism of low expectations, if in the name of being tolerant, you're actually allowing the, the Muslims in your country not to have to think critically, you're really saying, you know, that they're not as intellectually and culturally sophisticated as you are, like they don't have that natural capacity, <laughs> right? So that, that could be the racism or that you're not going to question people's emotions or desires, their desire not to change or not to consider alternatives, which again is um, either racism or it's just plain old self-destructive 
Because if your whole society is based on that kind of constant critique, how can you have citizens who basically don't do it and you don't ask them to do it, right? Does that make sense, Ashlyn? Because I think you are saying it's natural to think. Go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, I was, I was telling it, it's making sense, yes. Okay. Um, Let's see, who has not spoken who would like to speak? We'll try that for a minute because there's lots of people out there I could call on. Um, all right. Thank you, I haven't speak yet. Okay, Isabel, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I would also like to uh, actually talk about the points that uh, my classmates have already mentioned. So especially for the woman who is uh, actually being smart in making decisions when her parents is actually asking her to marry. So I think this, this was a very good step for her for, to make the decision. If, if, the, it is, if this uh, situation happened or this mindset happened to other women, especially, um, the people who are living in a society, I mean, the, the family where they have to follow what the parents is actually saying. So women need to really think about this and be smart in making decisions in their lives so, so that they cannot uh, actually always follow what their, their family is asking them to do. So uh, otherwise they will, uh, Actually, it will lead them to uh, to do some something bad in their lives, such as like if they follow their parents to get married in the early age. So it also mentioned the book that if they do that, it will also lead them to think about the bad things in their life, like they can uh, think to go for a drug addiction and all, or go for the prostitution stuff. So this is actually a uh, not really good thing that happened to a woman. So yeah, women should be smart in making decisions. Otherwise they will also uh, live in the society, I mean, uh, in the life where they have to take other decisions to, to be happy instead of uh, staying in an unhappy marriage life. So, right. So I would say, you know, having your parents forcing you to marry at a young age is just the absolute cornerstone to being submissive. So then your husband will basically treat you the same way, right? Because that's exactly. the rules of the game. And so you either decide that you're going to let yourself be submissive and obedient the rest of your life because it won't change, right? Or yeah. you're going to say no, right? And, um, and that's hard. I, re I remember when I first started teaching, and Asia remembers this, I was, I think I'd been at, I think it was the first day of class. I was teaching a class about falling in love with love as opposed to actually relating to people. And so I said, I mean, have you ever been to a wedding? and you can't tell if people are in love with the feeling of being in love or if they actually know something about that person, right? Their character, because people are blinded by just this feeling. And it was so funny because the students looked at each other like, she doesn't, she's not from around here. <laughs> and then it hadn't even crossed my mind. And they said, uh, Professor Beck, most of the weddings we go to were arranged. <laughs> I'm like, oh, and then <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, like cultural moment. <laughs> I'm in a different place. I'm not in the U.S. Uh, yeah, and then I mean, the only thing I could say is, well, don't idealize the fact that people get choices because they often make a whole bunch of other mistakes. Uh, but you know, it was really funny. Um, yeah, that would not happen in my country. Um, 
it would really unbelievably that would be so far out that people would just think, well, it might happen in a Muslim sub community, right? It would not happen among the European uh, immigrants. So anyway, that is that's interesting. And I do think, Isabel, you're right. And that's really tough for a woman because to reject the person your parents pick is such a huge move, right? For any anyone whose parents expect that, that's huge. But on the other hand, if you accept it, that's huge too. It's a watershed. Does that make sense to the rest of you? Um, yes, so far, so it makes sense. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't give advice. I just want to point that out, though. That's just um, such a big coming of age experience for all of you. Okay, Aurora, what did you want to say? Yeah, I read the article, and uh, also the article is named Nomad, but I think it's basically a finger pointing at Islam. The writer has always had to flee from one country to another in her childhood, and this is most likely due to the political opposition of her father. But at a point in the absence of her father, a school teacher influenced her to become a devout Muslim. Later, when her father asked her to marry a stranger, she disrespected her family and left him for Holland. There, she faced some event that led her to search the Quran and realized that she had never been a Muslim. After that, she made a film with the film director named Theo Van Gogh to show how Islam oppressed women. But in my personal opinion, I think Islam never oppressed women. Islam says that a children, a child's paradise in under the mother's feet. It means how high the dignity of women in Islam. It is, uh, we can say like this, Islam is mis in misrepresented by many, which led her to the idea that Islam oppressed women. The fact is that uh, her experience with Islam was bad. And when she wrote about this bad experience, her atheist readers uh, supported and encourages her a lot. Yeah, that's it. Okay, good. So I did want, actually, I was looking forward to um, having students disagree. Okay, Saida wants to speak and she has requested that I pause the recording. And so if anybody wants to speak but doesn't want it on the recording, let's see, Fatima, do you have something to say? And let me know if you want to turn off the recording. Fatima, are you there? Okay, so make sure to put it in the chat. If you, um, if you, you know, the microphone, something's wrong, just so I know that you're there. Um, let's see. Pooja, have you spoken on Nomad yet? Oh, there's Saida. Here she comes. Yes, Professor, earlier I did. Oh, okay. I remember what you said, but I didn't remember. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't remember which which um, book it was about, but that's fine. Okay, Saida, are you are you ready? Saida, are you connected? Okay. Um. Uh. I can't hear you, Saida. Okay, Saida, your microphone, go ahead. Saida, okay. All right, so um, let's see, who else? So, uh, Nuchat, did you talk about this? No, Professor, I Yeah, don't. okay, Nuchat, go ahead. 
the first thing that I want to point out is um, I really liked how uh, traveling and meeting people, mixing with different culture, um, made her realize what she wants from her life, what kind of a psyche she wants to build up. So uh, the, uh, that is again made me think that it's very important for us to mix with different cultures to um, and also as Mill says that conditioning not only I think not only in our childhood but also when we grow up we change like for example I grew in a very conservative environment but when I went to AUW obviously my thoughts changed and at that time I was in a young age but also I was not a child like 20 uh, 21 so uh, even then I changed so it doesn't matter uh, at what age we are at times um, the environment actually influences a lot so yeah we actually the um, I think one of the main ways to find out what we actually are seeking from this life and what how, what type of psyche would give us uh, the ultimate peace and happiness is to mix with more and more people and culture. Okay, and the second thing that I want to point out is um, the actions, the decisions of the father made um, uh, made the family suffer. Um, so this is something uh, this is somewhere I actually I sometimes actually think about this like the father wanted to get involved into uh, if I'm not wrong the father wanted to get involved um, into politics and work for the country because the, uh, it was the government ha was a dictator and so he wanted to do something bigger in, and he had a different view of life but the thing is he was a person who was involved in a family he was a, um, all he had a family Both, uh, all of them were a family and all, whatever decision he is going to take is uh, going to affect um, uh, the other family members because when one is in a family all their lives are connected so I think it's a very critical decision for a human being to make um, whether to go for uh, the goal that the person has or to make family because by nature human are human beings are ambitious and also human beings need companionship so um, I also personally when I think about how to shape my future how to shape I get confused whether to focus uh, completely on my career or whether to uh, or do I want a family because I think uh, I'm I, I, every person needs companionship and I think it's very difficult for anyone to understand how to balance this two and I think it no one thing can give you happiness being a human being you need both you also need identity you also need to flourish as a human being and also you need uh, people around us who loves you and who will make you feel that you matter also so yeah it's it's difficult for a person to balance and thirdly uh, what i want to mention is about um, that it's um, even sojourner truth she uh, she mentioned about the misinterpretation of religion as she and that is why she want uh, she wanted children to read uh, for her because she doesn't want misinterpretations or their own biases into that so th i think there are many places even um, i hear people misinterpreting and then when i myself research and uh, find out the facts um, i things get more clear so there are times when we listen to people we listen to people's ideas and concepts and then we ourselves do not research or try to find out uh, from our side so that what that's what creates a lot of misinterpretations misunderstanding um, so yeah, yeah these are all the things that I wanted to point out and oh yeah another thing <laughs> another thing is um, I think about the family thing that I was saying that um, if uh, when you form a family your lives get connected with uh, other family members so uh, regarding this i think about children i think people do not care think about things um before taking a children they mostly in at least in my country whenever they think that they are financially stable they will go for oops uh, so uh, sorry uh, I, I someone came actually okay so um, I think people do not uh, think thoroughly about everything whether they will be uh, completely um, 
be able to take the responsibility or not and i think a, ch a child actually needs their parents actually needs that environment that loving and secure environment uh, to grow up and to develop a healthy psyche but parents uh, their interest um, gets conflicted their ideas get conflicted and as a result their ch children suffer so i think it's really important to understand if they both are ready for a child and if they are actually ready to go for that whole journey because ch children are like responsibilities and you have to kind of uh, that is a commitment that you will go on for your whole life so yeah okay actually um that's a big theme in uh greek tragedy there are three tragedians that whose work has gotten passed down and the only story that all three of them wrote about was the story of Iphigenia. And that story is about how Agamemnon's responsibilities to the city conflicted with his responsibilities to his family. And the way it's described in terms of a drama, because in tragedy, it all gets blown up, is that he was going to go uh, to Troy to, to uh, solve an injustice. Uh, the Trojans broke hospitality agreements and it really needed to be addressed. Like this was a just war. The trouble was um, he could have tried diplomacy. He really kind of wanted to just show them who's boss. And what happened was he ended up having to kill his oldest daughter before the winds would blow and he could the, the ships would sail. And so the idea there is that even this happens to really good people, that if they're good at ruling, okay, there's always greedy folks and there's power hungry folks who are never home, but we're talking about really good people, right? And the society figures out these people are really good. We need them. And so the society makes demands on them and they can't meet their responsibilities to their families. And especially the oldest one tends to get crippled the most because they tend to step in and fill the void, right? And start acting like the parent. Um, but this is, okay, so it is important for all of you to know, the AUW students to know, that the problem of balancing family and career is really huge, and it hasn't been addressed very well, even in the developed countries. So there was an article a couple of years ago. I think Denmark has the most progressive policies uh, you get two years of uh, salary after your kid is born. Um, let's see. So even then, you know, the studies show that if a woman has one kid, <laughs> her career is set back. Well, and seriously set back. Well, the thing is a lot of women decide, I don't care that much about that stupid career, you know? It's 80 hours a week for 40 years, like who cares? Um, but the other side of it is women often have to choose between a career that uses their mind and their talent and a family because often they're given this either or, right? instead of being able to work part-time for a while. Uh, so it really is a problem. And so Nuchat, that balancing, I mean, you're right about that. And again, if any of you want to do any research on that, so you do have a second paper, right? That needs to be a research paper of some sort. And I did say, you can check the syllabus, but I'll, I'll, I'll do an announcement related to that. But what the syllabus said was to check out some way that psychology is being practiced um, and how that relates to the healthy psyche as we've read about it. 
And one of the students in her post actually brought that up, that a father brought his daughter to a psychiatrist because she was suicidal. And the psychiatrist gave some drugs and the girl actually committed suicide. So then he did some research about these drugs and found out one of the side effects is depression. And so I <laughs> wait a sec. So uh, yeah, that would be flagrant. Um, just ignorance or is there a, she didn't mention profit motive, right? You have to be careful if the profit motive has anything to do with this stuff. Um, but so you can do that. But you could also do something like, what about women trying to juggle family and career? And what's the, what's the, what are the facts about it? And what's the psychological effect on a woman? Does this increase her stress even more? There's all sorts of stuff about women having a second shift. Uh, they do more work at home. Um, that when they take part-time jobs, they end up working a lot more hours than the part-time and yet getting paid way less. So, so that's, uh, that's good, Nuchat. That was a good thought and it's legit. And it does help me remind you that you do need to start in on the second paper. And um, I will not grade you down according to when you hand it in. I'm just warning you, <laughs> I wouldn't put it off forever. But the first paper is just trying to get oriented, you know, what's my final statement so far about a healthy psyche. This particular reading about enlightenment over here versus religion over here might inspire you to write your paper because you can bring in anything we've studied so far, because now you have what that means, enlightenment, and you have those essays by Kant and Mill. So you have all the stuff you need to write definitely a 1,000 word paper, you know? And then the next paper is some kind of research about the way the psychology is practiced today, and then comparing that to what we've read. Because in general, when you study psychology, you study it as a detached observer, right? Here's what schizophrenia is, here's what this is. You, but the way I teach it is you do it, right? You're not a detached observer, you're engaged. You're using your mind a certain way, but that's different, right? So, the way I teach it is basically you're your own therapist. <laughs> you have to do your own therapy and educate your psyche. Um, but I actually think if you want to get into the profession of therapy, you probably will be a better therapist if you have thought about all this stuff, right? And, um, and you can give you know, wiser counsel if you're not just a, you're a detached observer once someone comes and is your patient or whatever, but the fact that you have, you know, trained your own psyche uh, according to your own ideas is probably going to help you give better advice than just you're sort of observing this specimen of a person with schizophrenia. And of course it has nothing to do with you and you're, you know, above all this, but you want to help them. I think it, I think you might be better if you, if you have more empathy and you identify with some aspect without projecting or without interfering in the, in the process. Um, I remember when I went to someone and I saw her at the, the lunchroom and I thought, well, here she is. She has this job with all these people. She's like-minded. She doesn't understand my problems, right? <laughs> and that happens, right? And then uh, she said, I think you already know everything that I was trained to help you with because I think a lot, right? But then I just figured out that's okay. This is what I want from you. <laughs> 
And so that's a different kind of patient, I can tell you. But um, so just any, you know, you can write, you can find some topic that would be of interest to you related to psychology. And I'm curious, you know, I just want to leave it open-ended. And so that's why I like to have students come in in office hours and talk to me about it. But um, new chat, that's definitely one theme, how women have to deal with balancing career and family that every one of you could write on that as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you'd all come up with something different, but that will be an issue for all of you. There's no question about that. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, new chat. Okay, go ahead, new chat. So I wanted to, you were talking about one of the posts. So it was from me about that uh, psychologist giving uh, medicines okay. which had side effects of depression. So maybe I forgot to mention that the reason behind the psychologist doing that was because in our country, people are um, psychologists or psychiatrists do not have much patience because we do not in Bangladesh we do not believe in mental health and all of those so people do not actually go to seek help from those from psychologists so the, what they do is they um, intentionally um, most times uh, what I have seen from the articles and all uh, heard they most times try to um, keep the patients for as long as possible by giving them medicines and and, and also uh, most of the times uh, whenever any patient goes to any psychiatrist or psychologist they, psych, uh, the psychiatrist always prescribe a lot of medicines and I have heard from many people you know because mental health is such a sensitive topic in our country because people still are not very aware and uh, so w the people it's a very small amount of people who are actually aware and want to um, take help but those people also when they are trying to get help they are getting uh, into such difficulties they are saying that oh my god when i went there they, they he or she gave me so many medicines and these are so high powerful dose medicines and those actually create uh, problems and uh, when they take those medicines they, they, their conditions get worse so they do that basically so that the patient keeps coming and the problem doesn't get solved are the are there any laws against that um i actually don't know about laws actually the um the situation or the the um the idea of mental health among people is so less in fact um some days ago, I heard, uh, I I read a news article where a patient was killed by the pe people of the hospital of the asylum because um, and they um, they they were saying that the patient was very furious and was uh, and they were not able to control that person. But the the family members of the patient were saying that no, our patient was not that um, in a critical situation that that person will make that amount of noise that you have to. Um, beat that person so much or control that person physically so much that you will kill that person so actually the uh, the p mental health patients in our country are also in a very bad situation they don't get proper treatment because yeah the uh, doctors and psychiatrists are not that much okay good so so uh, you got you all could write on psychiatry like asylums the seriously mentally ill or you could write on therapy, you know, just sort of counseling for people who are functioning day by day, they just want to function a little bit better. Or you could write about women trying to juggle and the, the psychological effects of that. Um, there's just lots of different things you could write on. Um, let's see, what I want to do right now is give everyone a chance to, for one last comment if they feel like I haven't called on them or they've thought of something since then. And then I'll let you out half an hour early. I do have, I do wanna talk a little bit more about the article, but I will try to let you out half an hour early and you must sit and write your post, okay? have to promise me because there's nothing else you, you have to do, right? Okay, hey, Rita gave me a thumbs up, so yay. Uh, Musoma? 
Uh, yes, Professor, I cannot promise that. To be honest, I uh, I have like you know my computer does not have charge and that's and okay. I, no... I mean, but then I, mean, I post always like... exceptions, so don't worry. <laughs> I'm not going to check up on you, right? There are always exceptions, but for those of you for whom it is possible, um, yeah. I want you to not let this weigh on your mind. I do not want this class to become this horrible, you know, thing that you have to try to get done. Um, I want you to try to do it right away, even if it's not your best work, because you can always uh, write a better one the next week. And the fact that I'm behind right now means that, it, I'll pr I mean, if it's okay with you, I'll try to wait a couple days to read them so that if you do want to revise it, you could revise it in within a day or two, but just try to get it done uh, right after class is over so that you can move on and, and uh, you don't waste your time. So that's the plan. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit more of this introduction where I hadn't yet finished the outline because, hey, I'm working at the last minute, right? not like any of my students. Um, and if anybody else wants to talk, just raise your hand and I'll notice that and then I'll let you talk. Um, so she said, you know, she was straddled between the West and Islam um, and it took its toll. And she said, she talked about this, which I think is, is good. My nomadic journey, in other words, has above all been mental, right? And that's, as a philosopher, that's my big thing is that ideas matter a lot. And so you have your journey physically, uh, your journey, but then you have psychologically how you're processing that. And that's the journey ultimately, that's the one that'll win out in the end. Because if you can process it in a way that makes you healthy, these experiences will end up with this wonderful result. But if you can't process it, the same experiences can end up with a very negative result. So it isn't necessarily the experiences themselves, but also as you interpret, you literally make choices that create a different life history, right? So you start having different experiences. But all those watershed events where something comes in that you didn't control and you can either, you know, react or you can act, right? It can be passive, it can be active. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, she says, you have to say farewell to tribal life, right? Tribal life is not healthy. And the West should not allow you to have a tribal mentality and live in their country and reap the benefits of living there. Um, you have to practice the life of a citizen. This goes back to Aristotle, remember? Think like a citizen. Or, um, uh, you know, Kant and Bentham. But the modern view is more individualistic. The ancient view is more thinking like a citizen. Um, and so all the tragedies and the organization, the fact that plays were performed in front of everyone and the people had to vote, all that stuff is trying to educate you in citizenship very deliberately. Um, okay, he's, uh, let's see. Islam, the three main barriers to the process of integration are the treatment of women. Um, and then when women are treated as servile and they accept it, they're unable to prepare their own children to become successful citizens in modern Western societies. So their daughters repeat the same patterns, right? So you can think about whether she's right about that. And then you could also compare your own life 
but you're most of you are the exception to the rule, right? So, but how do you how do you change that, right? And the second one is money. That, and she tells a story when she gets to the Netherlands. She gets an apartment, and then these people call. Do you want a carpet? Do you want furniture? Do you want curtains? Oh yeah, you know. <laughs> they come in and they show her all these samples, and, and she just doesn't know anything about. She she has a credit card, so she just puts it on her credit card, and all of a sudden she's just clueless about like money. She was never taught how to handle it. And then the last one is the socialization of the Muslim mind. This is probably I'm sure this is one of the things that um, Aurora was disagreeing with. She says all Muslims are reared to believe that Muhammad was perfectly virtuous and that the moral strictures, commands he left behind should never be questioned. The Quran is infallible. Um, and she says, this makes Muslims vulnerable to indoctrination and to violence. Um, it explains the violence because it justifies demonizing everybody else, killing other people. Um, and so sex, money, and violence are the problems. And then she's going to suggest some remedies. First of all, um, you, need to ex you need to demand from Muslims living in Western countries. They must learn to give up some of their habits, dogmas, and practices and acquire new ones, okay? Um, and then she criticizes many well-intentioned Westerners trying to settle refugees, they help them preserve their culture and they excuse their religion from critical scrutiny. Yeah, what's packaged in the compassionate language of acceptance is really a cruel form of racism. So um, you can think about that. And then you can think that's what Benedict did <laughs> without, you know, without ever, it wouldn't even occur to her that you're racist by you don't you just idealize these little enclosed societies with their little paranoid yams folks and their head hunting um you're not expecting them to think critically at all right um but anyway if they would come to america they can't you know they can't do the yam thing or the head hunting thing um they would really have to adapt. So, okay, then there's three institutions that can help in the transition. And of course, number one, you know, is public education. So once again, we're back to education. The European enlightenment of the principles of critical thinking. When she went to the Netherlands, education was aimed at helping the masses emancipate themselves from poverty, superstition, and tyranny through the development of their cognitive abilities. So she's talking about during the enlightenment. With the spread of democracy, um, reason-based institutions expanded, social skills and the discipline required to achieve success in the world beyond the classroom was taught, literature was expanded so that students' imaginations were expanded, they could have empathy with other people. All of this stuff is preparing them for citizenship. Um, however, some Westerners try to be more considerate of the faith, customs, and habits of the immigrants. Textbooks gloss over the fundamentally unjust rules of Islam and present it as a peaceful religion. All right, so that's her take on it, right? And Aurora would probably disagree, but each of you is gonna have a different reaction. That's what I want. It's just that as you react, you have to explain, you know, which quotes in the Quran um, 
uh, it, it, is she glossing over, right? Which things is she leaving out? Okay, so that's number one, education. Number two is the feminist movement to help, help Muslim women find their voice. All right, and what she says would be outrageous to most Muslims. Any Muslims that consider themselves conservative, she's saying, you have to do this. Well, yeah, I, that's, that's not, I don't think it's very practical. There's got to be a more middle of the road thing, I think. But anyway, any of you can have the opinion you want. Muslim girls must be free to complete their education. They have to gain ownership of their own bodies and their sexuality. Uh, that's going to go over real well, right? And they have to be able to enter the workforce and stay in the workforce. Now, I mean, I may agree with this, but this is a real problem because this is incredibly radical, right? compared to what most of those Muslims. And um, they, okay, the West needs to educate Muslim men on the importance of women's emancipation and education and to punish Muslim men when they use violence in order to protect Muslim women from physical harm. Again, I might agree with that, but her presenting that that's what has to be done and realizing how incredibly far that is from where they are, that is the problem, right? You can't just say, okay, guys, here it is. This, 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 so there, you know, that is, that's, that might be where you want to end up, but to do that is going to create uprisings, like big uprisings. So, you could argue that what is practical wisdom? What's the best thing in the situation, right? And it seems to me the boots on the ground, like people who are there in the middle of it would have a better judgment about it. So yes, they're the two extremes. Okay, what's the middle ground? Well, we'll let them wear their headscarves, but they have to read this book and that book, whatever. They have to learn Dutch or they have to, right? They have, to, okay, so if the immigrant women do not learn the native language, they aren't ever gonna be able to get a job, right? And so then they'll be marginalized. So you could demand that they learn the native language. Just something like that. I just think, you know, it's got to be more nuanced than this. That would be my opinion. It's just not nuanced at all. And then um, the, the community of Christian churches. Um, so the, the kind of Christianity that Westerners, uh, that Europeans secularize Christianity uh, engage in is useful in the battle against Islamic fanaticism because the people do believe in God, right? So they aren't like these awful atheists, but they think of God as love, right? God is love and Jesus wants us to love each other. And you read the Sermon on the Mount and that would be fine. So Muslims could accept that bridge, right? And so that's where, to me, Aristotle's virtues are a bridge. And you could find that common ground. So it's more than just love. It's actually a whole lot of stuff. Um, but, and she admits that some fundamentalist Christian groups are just as at odds with the Enlightenment as fundamentalist Muslim groups. Okay. Um, so... So her conclusion is just that the West urgently needs to compete with the extremist Muslims, um, provide, provide education, protect women, and give alternative kinds of spirituality. So 
she says that the book itself is a conversation that she wishes they could she could have with her own family so um some of you write the first assignment about the letter to your friend you can write a letter to your family members or a letter to yourself right um thinking about stuff right that you wish that they would know you were thinking about or you wish that you could change their mind on something whatever i'm not gonna tattletale on you or anything so <laughs> all right does anybody else have uh raise your hand if i don't see any other hands you have a half an hour to go do your homework um and the next the next assignment is going to be that in atheist well, it's going to be Enlightenment Humanism. And I'll, I should post that. I'll post that now, right? So any other questions? You could just leave whenever you like and start writing. Um, Masoma, is your hand up or is that from before? Uh, yes, Professor, I just wanted to mention that Said that wrote in the chat box her answer. Say what? Uh, say the wrote in the chat box, Professor. Oh, her oh. answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. So here's Saida. She doesn't think Islam, Islam oppresses women. Because in comparison to other religion, Islam gives dignity to women the most, okay? It's said that heaven lies in the feet of the mother. Muhammad says the importance of the mother is three times more the father. Even Muhammad's wife was a businesswoman. And um, mother was the most talented of all. So Islam doesn't stop them from reading. In the article, she said she was forced to marry, but in Islam, children can't be forced to marry. So I think it's not Islam, which was bad for her. It's the people who made it that way. People can be bad to show the real meaning of religion. So I don't really agree with her being a fervent religious person. Yes, well, that's true. I, was, I expected that there would be some students who would react to this that way. So I didn't, I did not, assign this because I agree with it, right? I assigned it because, first of all, she is from, right? She's not from where you all are from. She was from Somalia and then she, she was a nomad. So she was living under some pretty extreme circumstances. And, you know, when you have 1 billion Muslims, they live under different circumstances, right? Um, but she is willing, she was willing to make a lot of generalizations and it's fine with me if you have different reactions. The thing that you don't know about her is that when she got to America, she, her job, she got hired by what's called the American Enterprise Institute, which is very pro-Western, but it's also pro-capitalism. And, um, I think she's getting used actually by these people to just further their agenda, which is partly Western, pro-Western, but the pro-capitalism part is really, to me, doing a lot of harm to these countries. And I, I just think it's complicated, right? There's all these layers and layers of stuff, but I, for her to be willing to just uh, advocate for the American Enterprise Institute. She mentions some people and she completely supports them and they're not as wonderful and good as she seems to think. And so, and they are the source of her income. So I do think there's a lot of complexity there, but I think each of you just sort out what you think by reacting to her that's that's your job and i didn't assign things because i agree with them i assigned it because it brings up a lot of issues actually 
Um, anybody else? Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. So those of you who want to go can go if you want to, you know, start working on your homework. Go ahead, Isabel. Professor, actually, one thing that uh, you mentioned about um, women are like wearing scarf and stuff. So women are what? Thing, wearing a scarf. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the thing that I'm still questioning is that like in, in Muslim, like, they are asking a woman to cover uh, what I, I heard from some Muslim friends. Like they're asking women to cover all their bodies except their hands and their face. So, but they do not apply it to men. So I'm actually still confused. What is actually the biggest reasons of uh, applying this kind of stuff? I mean, if you have an idea of why Maybe you could explain. I don't well, know yeah, what I, mean, I, I do think that it's blaming women for men's feelings of sexual attraction, right? But um, they couldn't. They couldn't only say to women because men can also do this kind of stuff. Like, how well, can men do that? It's okay I'll not tell to you, cover everybody, but only women. I mean, I'll tell you another thing that really annoys me is I have this image, I don't know, do you know the game badminton with the birdie? Anyway, they, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, and they have this birdie. And it just seems to me like men are using women like a birdie. Okay, so the liberal men say, my women can dress, can wear bikinis in, the, you know, anything <laughs> they want because we're liberal. And then the other one, my women wear these black burkas where you can't see anything. And yeah, yeah, because we're so superior. This is like, isn't anyone going to ask the women, right? And how come, you know, so I think actually this whole thing of using women's bodies for men to score points about how pro-women they are, just that really annoys me. Does everybody understand that? The thing is, what I'm questioning, I mean, what I'm thinking about it is like, why they're not applying to men as well? Because men could also lead uh, people to, to, to be seen or something like that. That's, that's what I mean. If they want to apply, maybe you, they should apply for both uh, sexes. Uh, it's, I it's understand. Not, it's not only women, it's, it's, it's not really, I mean, makes sense here. So that's why I'm just thinking, I mean, curious about like, I want to, I just want to know the, what's the biggest reason of this, uh, applying this kind of. I think it's just projection. Men feel those feelings of attraction. Uh, professor. Yeah. yeah. Sorry for interrupt, but in Islam, it is said not only women, but also men should be valid. Even if a woman is not uh, valid, a man has to cover his eyes. Oh, oh. If but they, they didn't, I mean, in the reality, that like uh, men are not always cover all their uh, yeah, bodies it is, like women. Uh, it is people who didn't cover, but Islam say to cover both, not only women, but also men. Okay, I mean, so that's, I mean, the other thing is the problem of what it says and what people actually do, right? That's, yeah. Yeah, so Aurora, I mean, you, can, you can say that yeah there's a lot of equality i mean i try to teach islam very sympathetically um but then you know the the woman who wrote nomad she starts with her experience right yeah and then and, yeah go ahead also what i notice is that like every friday is uh, a special day for muslim and they go to mosque and pray but i actually sometimes i see it uh, on the balcony and see what, what's what they are uh, actually going through the boss. But I only see men who goes there. So is that all, the mosque is only for men or it can be also for women or um, kind of like really curious about it. I, I don't say that it's, it's not good or it's not, but I just want to know the reason of why like women is not going there oh. like every Friday. Yeah. I'm sure it varies from country to country. And then, Sorry? 
I think it varies. Yeah, exactly. It from varies country. from country to country. Because in our Bangladesh, usually we follow the Bengali rules. All women doesn't cover up. We wear all women doesn't wear burqa. We also wear shari, non-salar kameez, and western. And uh, all men also uh, don't wear cover up like Islamic uh, uh, Islamic clothes. They also wear uh, random clothes. So it actually vary from country to country. In Bangladesh, they're uh, actually mixed up. So yeah. we different people like and choose different uh, dress up. That's it. Also, I think in some mosques, the women and the men are separated, right? In other mosques, they're not separated. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I I think again the the woman who wrote Nomad, it's a point of view that should be addressed because. She worries about this paranoia that a few radicals will commit acts of terror and then the West will have a backlash against everybody. I mean, that, that stuff, it's good to know that people are thinking about stuff like that. That's, there's a lot of stuff to learn from this without actually having to agree with her on everything. Does that make sense? Aurora, does that make sense to you? Why? I yeah, professor. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It's just the idea of why I would assign it. Not, uh, I don't, I'm a teacher to me. I don't get on soapboxes, but every once in a while, <laughs> like you have to attach your faith to reason or just don't take a philosophy class, right? <laughs> That's where I draw the line because uh, it is a philosophy class. But other than that, you know, I like to, I just like to make students give good arguments. And uh, that works. They should want to anyway, if they want to defend their religion, which is fine, Saida. Um, then you just have to give some good arguments. And that's what educated people do. But um, really, a lot of you are still hanging out and I don't want to take all your time. So you can leave and do your homework. Thank you so much, Professor. You have a good day. I really enjoyed the discussion. Again, I'm sorry I didn't finish reading, but people are starting to hand stuff in. There was lots of it. And as I said, I had my house guest. And uh, someday, one of these days, I'm going to tell you what her life is like. You will not believe how primitive life can be in the U.S. Her parents are drug addicts. It's... It's crazy, <laughs> but I, you know, I'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks for coming prepared. I appreciate it. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ms. Mama. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye, Professor. Have a good night. Bye. Goodbye, Aisha. Good night, Aurora. Bye, Professor. Bye-bye, Falak. I only wish I could see you in person. But we are not going to whine and feel sorry for ourselves, right? That's passive. <laughs>